my family has a different religion. That should settle it. Uh, religions are pretty much all the same. We just have a different tradition from you, so leave me alone. My response is this. Uh, my friend Steve Karitsis was a Greek and, and uh, outspoken. <clears throat> People would tell him, I, I, uh, I'm a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. His response was, the Greek Orthodox Church will send you to hell. So he had a blunt, blunt manner. I don't know if you have the character quality to carry that off without getting punched. But um, my comment is, where did that religion come from? You dare not rely on the religions invented by man no matter how many people believed it down through the years. The question is, is it based on truth or not? You see, Once we get away from that idea that all religion is not truth, it's just a way of thinking, we, we miss the point. See, um, You're giving people in, in, this, in these religions, you're giving people a, a, a travel plan that sends them to the wrong place. We understand that if we imagine trying to argue for naval navigation, get out on the boundless sea and, and so on, but it's based on the belief of a flat world. Well, it's just not going to work because your initial thinking is wrong, you see. There is a truth. Imagine building your trip into space based on the belief that the heavenly bodies are holes in a black covering beyond the moon. These things are not going to work, you see. So try to navigate your path to heaven by a false belief, and it won't work. I want to begin by looking at two examples of Christ confronting religious people. Uh, there are more examples than this, but I just wanted to take these two. The first one is from Matthew 19, 16 to 22. Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You see the presuppositions here? Uh, Christ is good. He's a teacher, the word master, a, a rabbi. And, um, but uh, I'm, uh, my life is not all on track, he, he is saying. I need something else. I don't know what it is, but uh, things aren't right with me. And while I'm very religious, he's going to explain that, I'm lacking something. So in his way of thinking, it was all made up of good things to do. And his question is, what good thing am I lacking? What good thing do I do that I may have eternal life? Which one tips the scales for me? Which one makes me such a good keeper of the law that God says, oh, well, I'm so impressed. Come right on in. So he sensed a lack in his life. Um, we sense a lack in our life anyone, when we are relying on faulty information. You know, our senses only perceive so much. Uh, we only see a certain range of the light spectrum. We only hear a certain range of the, the vibrations. We only feel a certain range of, of pressure, cold and hot and all that. So we have come up with a model of the world based on what our experiences are, how we've been talked to by others, things we've read, whatever. And that model of the world has left us with a deficit, left us with something. So we don't know how to correct what's wrong with us. So 
if your job is to counsel people that are having problems, your job actually is opening their eyes to things that they're not aware of. Uh, they, have, they have seen the world, but they've constructed it not on the world, because we don't deal directly with the world, we only deal with the world through our senses. <laughs> only what we perceive becomes the world for us, and so we relate to the world in this model that we've uh, uh, constructed in our mind. So when people do that, <clears throat> there are some things that they leave out. They're not acquainted with it. There are some things that they distort, and they see it differently than it really is. And there are some things that they just are confused about. So our job is to point out to them that they're missing something. This is what Jesus is doing. He does this then with these words. He said unto him, Why callest thou me good? He begins with a questioning of this very first thing that he said. Good master. There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He dismisses this immediately. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt, commit, not, shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father or the mother, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. So Jesus directed him back to the original law of Moses. Now, God gave the law of Moses to sinful man to show him his inability to live like God, to be perfect in the law of Moses, God's law given to, through Moses. Um, you know, uh, that should have directed him to live perfectly like God. God is love. So all the law and the prophets are telling us to love God, love our neighbor as ourselves. So he directs him back to that. However, in the twistedness of this man's life and the, his time, um, the young man said unto him, uh, no, 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 all these things I have kept from a youth up. What lack I yet? I know I lack something. But doing all that, and I, I've, I've, I've kept those laws. I lack something. So the man reveals that he did not comprehend the perfection of the law. He was keeping the watered-down version taught by his rabbis. They reasoned this way. God wouldn't tell us to do something we couldn't do. That was the very purpose <laughs> that God gave the law, to show you that your sin has removed you from the power of God. So Jesus comes back and says, okay, here's what you lack. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And don't get mixed up on this. That's not the path of eternal life, giving away everything, walking as a, a begging wanderer. Here's what Jesus did. He took him directly to the ultimate humble sacrifice of all of his hu humble, uh, uh, humble sacrifice of all his human resources. Everything he was depending upon to be better than somebody else. He said, get rid of all the things that are holding you up, that making you think you're okay, and take this opportunity to follow Jesus by faith. When you have nothing, you just walk with me. We eat if people give us food. <laughs> this is by faith, you see. This is how Jesus dealt with a religious man. He pointed out the one thing that he wasn't doing, and that's the heart of the gospel. Believing Christ, obeying Christ, and um, doing it by faith not by works. 
But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Understand what he was doing. He kept his less than satisfactory religion. You say, why, why do you say it's less than satisfactory? That's what he was coming to him for. <laughs> it's not working for me. I need something else. So he decided to keep that rather than give up his artificial support system. And we find this all around the world. The people have this artificial support system of their religion. And the religion is a national uh, thing. The, uh, the, they grew up with it. Their families do it. The aunt and uncle, they do it. They go home. They're expected to be a part of it. It's not an easy thing. It wasn't an easy thing for this young man, and he made the wrong choice. We have a, uh, a nicer ending to another story, and this from John 4, where Jesus meets the woman at the well. Verses 7 through 26. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, Jesus sitting at the well. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now he asks her because the disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat, buy food. So he's sitting there, and he didn't bring anything to lower down into the well and pull up water. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, Ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. <laughs> the first thing that surprised her was that a Jew would speak to a Samaritan. The differences in their religions was the first uh, barrier, these differences. Um, she says, you and I don't get along. See, you, maybe, you, maybe you missed that growing up. I'm quite aware of it. Um, what's going on here? See, if, you, um, if you jump ahead in your mind with who this woman was and what her life was like, uh, I get the feeling that she's uh, playing with this conversation with this, this man who's at the well. Uh, waiting to talk to somebody. See. Jesus changes that subject. He says, Jesus answered, said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. He breaks up the, uh, the back and forth thing about this and says, you're talking to someone who could give you an amazing gift. And if you just knew, instead of me asking you for this water, you would have asked me for that water, living water. So he introduced the concept of receiving a special gift from him. He turned it, turned it away. See, I'm offering something to you. Well, she's intrigued by this, and um, so she... A um, uh, woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his, his cattle? Jacob is Israel. See, You Israelites, you have to rever revere Jacob. And um, this is his well. You're, you're no greater than him, right? So she participates in this back and forth thing about water and living water and so on. What seems to, uh, probably seems to her to be witty conversation, perhaps flirting, I don't know. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, he's gesturing down into the well, <clears throat> shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The well they were sitting at is a water collector well. When it rained and so on, then it had water. Uh, what he's talking about is the artesian well that springs up. There was an artesian well up in, what was it, uh, north of us, 
for a while and just people go by and you see them filling up their jugs of water and so on. Uh, they've done something to it now. It's not, not there anymore. Um, <clears throat> but that's what he's talking about. Water that uh, doesn't need rain to regenerate itself. It regenerates itself automatically. So he is clarifying that he speaks of eternal life. So she responds with this idea. The woman said unto him, saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She's still holding to the, the literal water thing. She expresses interest <clears throat> in pursuing this gift. All right, well then, give it to me. Jesus saith unto her, he interrupts the process. Go call thy husband and come hither. I, I don't know what she looked like at this point, whether she uh, lowered her eyes and kind of looked away or what she said, but um, she says, uh, I have no husband. Jesus, looking right at her, said, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. By the way, if you are living with someone who you have not married, God says they're not your husband. Whatever the world says. Is that right? You see this? He showed her her sin. Um, so he brings up the whole need for repentance in a very personal way. And when he shows that he knows her sin, he doesn't know her. He's never met her. But he knows deep things about her, a history. She immediately falls back on the religious differences. <laughs> oh, well, we're talking about religion here then. Look how she goes into it. <clears throat> the woman said unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You, you know spooky things. Okay. So here's the defense. I wasn't brought up like that. Uh, my family has a different religion. She says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Irreconcilable differences, you see. So Jesus now takes her beyond Samaritan Jewish religious differences and focuses on God himself who seeks for men. God seeks for men to truly worship him. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He says, we're getting to the place where it's not going to be about place. <laughs> we're at the time when my Father is delivering all worship from place. It had been set at Jerusalem. That was the only place in the world where there was a temple of God where true worship could be done. But he says it's not going to be that way any longer. Ye, you Samaritans, worship ye know not what. This is the argument that I'm going to be presenting to you about world religions. You don't know what that is. We know what we worship. We Jews have been given this by God. We didn't make this up. God revealed it to us. For salvation is of the Jews. But <clears throat> the hour cometh and now is. He says, I'm, I'm the one bringing this hour upon us. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Internal, not external rituals. In truth, not in just what they make up. For the Father seeketh. Here's a picture of God wanting people to come to him. Seeketh such to worship him. And then he reveals to her something about God that is not in this way revealed anywhere else in the scripture. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a human body. He's not made of matter. 
God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. If they don't, they're not actually worshiping him. You see? So the woman's spiritual eyes at this point are opened. You have to be careful to see this. And she hesitantly expresses her hope of a savior. So she says this, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things, sort of like you're telling me. And I have to imagine with a smile, Jesus declares his deity to her. We find in the story what she does later, that she was saved at this point. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I am the promised Messiah. How direct he was <coughs> with this woman of another religion. So let me uh, share with you <clears throat> five things that I would like for you to keep in mind. Uh, perhaps jot down some of the verses, but at least have in mind the thought. Most of what I'm saying to you is just um, ways of thinking rather than leading you through myriads of verses. I believe most of you could add the verses yourself and should. <clears throat> the first thing is, is really a, a Bible study, a word study, because I want to say to you that religion is not Christianity. We're talking about two different things. It's even greater difference than apples and oranges. Christianity, religion, is not Christianity. Now, our King James Version uses the word religion five times. I want to show you all five, which isn't a, a whole lot. It's uh, uh, two passages and a verse. And um, the word religion, the English word, comes from two different uh, Greek words. In Acts 26.5, Paul is talking, giving his testimony and talking about people which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now the word religion here is the Greek word threskia. Now threskia is a noun that emphasizes diligence in the performance of the outward service of God. It applies especially to ceremonial worship. Do you catch what I'm saying? This is the busy stuff that you do in this religion. These are the, the things to offer. These are the things to, uh, to bring. These are the things to, uh, uh, to receive. It's all about the ceremony. So, threskia. In Galatians 1, 13 and 14, we have the word used twice, religion, but it's a different Greek word. For you have heard, he says to these Galatians, of my conversation, my manner of life, in times past, in the Jews' religion. That's one word in the Greek. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals. The King James explains my equals here means equals in years, people of my own age. In my own nation, <clears throat> being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now, as you can see, I put in the Greek word in English letters, eudismos. <clears throat> this is the word literally meaning Judaism. Uh, Paul here, and I want you to see this clearly, he distinguishes this from his present belief system. In times past, my manner of life was in the Jews' religion, and I persecuted the church of God. You see? You, do you see the contrast? What I, what I believed before was the Jews' religion, was Judaism. Now I am holding to the church of God. And um, 
He says, I profited in that ceremonial uh, system that had rejected Christ uh, by being more zealous of what? The traditions of my fathers. But he changed to follow the revelation of God. What God said was true. So um, God uses this word, Judaism, only in these two verses. Well, then we come to the last two uses of Thrascia with uh, added an adjective of the same word. James 1, 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious, this is the adjective, Thrascos, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion, here's the noun, Thrascia, is vain, empty, purposeless. <coughs> pure religion, pure Thrascia, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Again, the, the ceremonial religion we're looking at. Threskas is the adjective form of the noun threskia. <clears throat> it uh, emphasizes diligence in the performing of the outward service of God, and especially ceremonial service. This is the only time that we find that adjective used. A.T. Robertson references an article that he found in Essays in Biblical Greek to show that the word referred to external observances of public worship, such as church attendance, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. So, um, uh, and he was saying that uh, if you can't control your tongue, you're showing that your, your uh, outward show religion isn't, isn't really what it should be. So that's the uh, adjective, threskia, as I said before, is the noun that emphasizes diligence in the performing of outward service. Now, we do find, not translated religion, but we do find that um, Thrascia is found one more place, and that's in Colossians 2.18. Uh, Thrascia, uh, ceremonially uh, focused worship. Here he says, Colossians 2.18, Let no man beguile you or judge against you of your reward in a voluntary humility, being a, volu being a voluntary in humility, and worshiping, that's the word Thrascia, Worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Uh, picture what Thrascia is here. A worshipping of angels. It was a false worship. It is intruding into things they had not seen. <laughs> uh, where do they get this then? Well, they were vainly, empty, uh, puffed up in their fleshly mind. They're worshipping things they just made up, you see. Uh, a carnal, a fleshly way of thinking. So, this is the thing that we're dealing with. This is religion. Uh, uh, it is quite possible to consider Christianity a religion, but uh, that, uh, uh, Thrascia, but only to the extent that we are doing things within that belief system. Christianity focuses on the heart work. And to the extent that it's a religion, we come to church. We pass the offering plate, that type of thing. So uh, this is why James can call, um, refer to Christianity here as the only pure Thrascia. All the rest are made up from men. All right, <clears throat> let me give you four more things to think about concerning religion and Christianity. So number two, religion invents its truth. Christianity reveals God's truth. You catch what I'm saying? So religion finds truth in feeling and experience. Now, to defend them a bit, that's all they have. All they have are their senses. All they know is what they've seen, experienced, what others have told them. So they're trying to find 
a truth, some sense of purpose in life from the things of the world. They've sealed off God, sealed off heaven, and now just looking around what they have here. Religion begins with the concept that no one really knows the truth about God and the afterlife. Nobody knows that. Early Hinduism and Native American shamanism depended on drugged dreams to find spiritual ideals. Is it called peyote? You know these things? And they, these are uh, drug-inducing things. And they would uh, burn these in a fire in a, in a tent and, and uh, smoke it, basically. And uh, uh, they would have hallucinations. And these were supposed to be illuminations of revealing uh, whatever you called him, the Great Father or whatever. Uh, uh, the Hindus uh, had a drug called the Soma that they took, and it sent them on a mind trip, and uh, they uh, uh, built their religion on a drug experience. How, how safe do you feel going to heaven with that, right? Where'd you get that? Yeah, I got it out of a bottle, man. Mainline big denominations assume evolution is true. They're not taking drugs uh, for this purpose, but uh, they they drank the drink of evolution. So the Bible evolved. Ideas of God evolved. We can't take this as actual truth. It's just good men making their best guess. So what they say to believe has become take an irrational step. You don't take the drugs, you just have the same effect. You become irrational. You go beyond common sense and reason. You believe the unbelievable. Faith, they, they define faith as believing that which you know is not true. See? And yet, they say, they have to do this to give purpose to life. There is no purpose to life. We have to invent a purpose to life or life isn't worth living. So let us invent a truth. Let's believe what is unbelievable. How different Christianity is. Christianity finds truth in God's word. We don't invent it. We discover it. We find it revealed, uncovered. Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Christ said, John 17, 17, Sanctify them, praying to God, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we go to the source of truth to find the truth. We don't invent it. We don't make do with imagination. The third thing is this, religion assigns man's works. Christianity reveals Christ's works. This is an entirely different concept, these two. Religion demands works and sincerity. You have to do these good deeds, and you have to really believe it. Religions, and maybe you don't Maybe you're not aware of this, but religions like Confucianism, following Confucius, Shinto, which is a following of the traditions of the elders, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Buddhism is just a variant of Hinduism. Bu Buddha was a Hindu. They have no concept of a personal God. Uh, there is no God in Buddhism. This is why they've made Buddha a God, you see. Man needs a god to worship. They've invented that. Their goal is what then? Not connecting man with God. Not getting man to go to God's heaven. Hinduism has uh, the concept of, of the Brahma, which is the all. This is everything that is. The all in all. And their concept of salvation is finally being merged back into the all. <laughs> Told you about the, 
the Hindu went to the hot dog vendor and said, make me one with everything. <laughs> so their goal is modifying man's behavior. This is just get man to feel good about how he lives and to uh, not make a mess of things in society. Other religions have invented a heaven based on their previous leaders' concepts and imaginations. So now they have an, a heaven to offer because very often they hear Christians talking and that sounds good so they, they invent their own version of it, you see. But listen to me, they're inventing it. <laughs> they didn't find this given by God. They're making it up. What is this religion that uh, Tom Cruise was? Scientology. You heard of Scientology? You understand that it was invented by a science fiction writer who just decided that there, there was something to be done with this, you see. Uh, <laughs> I can hardly believe somebody just decides to take that. So. By contrast, Christianity reveals the gospel, the story of God's planning, the story of Christ's fulfilling the plan. Christianity reveals God's new covenant plan of salvation and the cost it demanded of Jesus Christ. Jesus not only paid the price of death, but also paid it so perfectly that God accepted it for all who would believe. This is our story, you see. We don't make up something. We don't invent something. Uh, we just recount what God tells us that he did out of love, giving man an opportunity after sin to undo it and the terrible cost of Christ on the cross. The fourth thing is this. Religion assumes man's ability. Christianity reveals man's inability. Now let me be clear about this. Religion invites reform and instruction. That's all that they're giving us. When they talk about Jesus, if they do, they're saying it tells us how to live right. Or he gives us the instruction that we were ignorant of. And that's all you needed. You're okay in yourself. You just need to change the way you act and the way you understand. Religion will not accept what the Bible gives as man's spiritual limitations. This is a great offense to the proud man. Um, what they called Calvinism back in that day <clears throat> was the, the great offense. It tells us that we're not everything we can be. And how dare you limit me in these things. If man needs anything, they say, he needs an example or instruction to do right. That's all he needs. He's just off track. Christianity, very different. Christianity demands a savior. Christianity reveals that man lost his connection of life with God when he chose to sin. Man was not able to reconnect. He was already in sin. He was dying. See? Disconnected from God's source of life left man dead and dying. Fact is, no amount of instruction will resurrect the dead. You know, sit there, talk to the dead person. Give him all the instruction you can. No good example will enable the corpse to rise. March around that, that dead body and say, just follow my example. Doesn't work. So what does the scripture say? Man needs a savior. See? He needs someone to save him, not teach him. Save him, not give him the good example. Christ was a teacher and a good example, but it was not that that saves man. It was his gospel work of death, resurrection, ascension. 
to reclaim the kind of life that God intended for him, you must have a savior. And let me close with this thought. Religion rejoices in the journey. Christianity rejoices in the finished work. Religion does not expect a completion of the religious work. It's just an ongoing thing. This is a change of uh, behavior. This is a way where you can be a little happier in what you're doing. You're not so frustrated. Why is this? Well, religion is man-centered. It pictures man lifting himself up to his own glory. He is ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Religion defines truth as an ever-changing ideal. One man wrote, if in my study I were to actually accidentally find truth, I would sadly, with grief, toss it back into the swirling mix that I might continue the journey, the pursuit. Pursuit of what again? A truth that you just threw back, decided not to believe? How different is Christianity? Christianity has an earnest expectation <coughs> of a completed work in you. God's work can be finished, can be completed, can be perfected. Christianity is God-centered. It pictures man in a dead and impotent, uh, no, no power to do anything state. When God reconnects him, man, to himself, the man is raised to new life, given ability to accomplish God's will, and is put on a program of improvement that results in a perfect man, perfect body, soul, and spirit. And God welcomes him into his eternal family at that point. How different these two things are. Religion is not Christianity. Uh, my family had a different religion. I'm really sorry to hear that because religion is not Christianity even though they called it that, if, if they did. It's not the same. <clears throat> One's an inner work, the other an outer work. And if you're dead and dying, all the outward works that you can manage don't change the fact that you have not connected to the source of life. Can we share this thought? <clears throat> can we have a friend who would listen to such a thing and um, understand it needs to be a repentance, a change of thinking. They have to re redefine the world as they've made it to include God's truth. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you might open our hearts to this truth. It is uh, the standard of, of our America today to be broad-minded and to accept everybody. <clears throat> and while we accept their person, we do not accept their wrong belief. We know, Father, that it puts people on the wrong path and sends them to hell. Their church sends them to hell. Their belief system sends them to hell. Their prayers send them to hell. <clears throat> it's not about the ritual. It's not about the ceremony. It's not about the thrakia, the uh, ceremonial religion. There, is, there are a dime a dozen They're all over the world, and every kind of variation uh, can be imagined. But it's about discovering the truth as you have revealed it, and then making us incorporate that truth in our understanding of life, and finding that there is an out. There is a thing, as the young man was asking Christ, that will give him eternal life, but it's not a thing for us to do but a fact for us to receive, a heart dedication for us to engage in. 
with heads bowed and eyes closed. It may be that you're saying, I've kind of been fooled by the things of the world and all the different religions are fine and, and uh, we, we need to be really respectful for them. And I, I'm saying no different, but I am saying this, that the respect of the person who needs salvation needs to be more for you than your respect of their false religion. Are you ready to say to them, your religion is your problem, not your solution? Christ has given us the solution. If that's your prayer, I wonder if you'd slip your hand up, say, pray for me. This is where I need to take these people. This is how I need to explain this to them. Help me to understand it well enough to explain it. Father, then we dedicate ourselves to Thee and know that Your Word gives us the truth. We pray that You might so work in our thinking <clears throat> that our hearts will become burdened with those who have taken a false way, have listened to false teachers. Generations are dying and going to hell because no one has stepped aside to change. I pray that You might help us then to have that evangelistic fervor the desire to see them on the right road, to take not the fake medicine, but the true cure. We pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.